Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the professor of computer science at Cornell Tech, Deborah Estrin. Thank you for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm one of the new members of the New York tech community, having moved out here from LA about a little over a year ago. So Asi asked me to uh, come here to talk about my interest in small data and how these data might fuel and be fueled by games. So it's about as much of a non sequitur from what you've just been listening to, what we've all been listening to, but hope you'll bear with me. So first, what do I mean by small data? Well, each time each of us uses our smartphone or social media, a search engine, a loyalty card at a supermarket or a drugstore, and of course, each time we play a game, we generate a trail of digital breadcrumbs. And the idea is that these digital breadcrumbs over time form the digital traces that tell a lot about our everyday behaviors and activities. And these data streams together from these disparate sources, from mobile phone to mobile game, from our online shopping to our bricks and mortar shopping, uh, together form our small data. And these data are used by the stores and the services and the search engines and the game makers to, of course, do big data analytics, do it from business analytics all the way to personalizing your experience or targeting advertising, uh, optimizing service, and so forth. And my interest is in how we can also use these data to draw powerful inferences about and for the individual. So in the future that we're building towards at Cornell Tech, you would be able to opt in to access your digital traces through, let's call them, personal data APIs. And you would be able to choose apps that would privately process, fuse, and filter those data for you. So to be a little bit more concrete about what I'm talking about uh, up here, I have just depicted an example of, of some of those uh, sources of data. Let me say a few words about why they're uh, interesting and why they're potentially uh, telling and useful. Um, so from a mobile app, something like Moves, which uh, captures data about your physical activity and location, <clears throat> that continuous measurement of activity and location can give us interesting information about how much we're moving about, popularized by Fitbit and the like, as well as our daily patterns, what time we're leaving the house in the morning, uh, if that tends to be shifting. Inferences can be made about, about sleep patterns, time gotten to work, what time you're getting to class, what time you're getting home. And those sorts of patterns over time, as I'll describe in a moment, are, can be useful inputs uh, into personal applications. Your cable TV box or your Nest box, your home utility information, is a complementary source of information that might give you additional and finer details about the rhythms uh, and your diurnal rhythms and the rhythms uh, at home. Your loyalty cards and your online grocery shopping have very rich information, maybe the richest information, about if not what food you're actually consuming, at least what food you're actually purchasing in a, in, a repeated, uh, in a repeated manner. And I'll come back to talk about an application based on that. Think about all the text and the language we use in our emails, in our texts, in our tweets. The language we use reflects things like sentiment analysis, uh, as well as as a source of data around things like cognitive fatigue or cognitive decline or a side effect of a medication that might affect us cognitively. And of course, when we uh, look at the entertainment we consume and the games we play, when and where and how well we play are also rich sources of information. No one of these is necessarily a great teller of your story and your pattern, but brought together, they can be uh, very rich. So one of my interests here is saying, can we take these small data and, in a sense, marry these small data with a lot that we've been learning around behavioral science and behavioral economics? Can we build apps, engagements, and games that use the small data that each of us generate 
to measure, motivate, and mitigate behavior change? Can we use these data to build engagements that, if you will, close the gap between our aspirations and our in-the-moment decisions? Maybe a, a term that's a little bit um, uh, uh, softer or more to the point when we each think about uh, the kind of habits that we're trying to uh, support. So just to give you two examples, um, uh, Martha up here on your left, who's perhaps become dependent on pain medications, an unfortunately increasing phenomenon, and she might well aspire to do things over the longer run that are going to reduce her levels of pain, things like losing weight uh, through a healthier diet, strengthening her back muscles, abdominal muscles, her flexibility, meditation and mindfulness even, which has been shown to help people with uh, pain. But in the moment, any one moment, of needing to be a patient parent or a productive employee, the uh, temptation and the availability of a pain medication that will make her feel better right now to help her be in the moment this better parent or employee, it's a really hard struggle. So can we begin to build engagements in a way that can help bring more present and make more salient some of these longer term uh, objectives that can work alongside and work over the longer term to help somebody get to the root of what might be behind their chronic pain. Give you another example, uh, somebody like uh, Sean here on your right, who struggles with uh, insomnia and depression. So when you're having uh, struggling to sleep, right, nothing quite so frustrating, Binging on whether it's Netflix episodes or late night comfort foods or uh, other forms of entertainment, when you're frustrated with not being able to sleep, just further reinforces those cycles of poor sleep and fragmentation and so forth. And so again, the opportunity to try to bring those longer term desires of ours, our aspirations, to make them more salient through presentation of data through games and engagement. Not that tech is a panacea, but can we use it to help create and sustain microenvironments for ourselves that can help us move our habits towards our aspirations? So for example, uh, taking on the food example, can we create healthier food environments and choices by our, uh, for ourselves at home or even in our selection of lunchtime restaurants? by capturing the data of what we choose to consume and what we choose to purchase, and bringing that, if, that concept that originally comes from the quantified self community, but really tying it into uh, experiences that could have even uh, broader play. Can we take these small data and help us drive planning and pre-commitment uh, exercises that cause us and uh, encourage us to plan what we're going to eat or what we're going to order for lunch because there's actually good uh, behavioral economic theory that says when you plan ahead, you make better decisions than the decisions you make in the moment. So people have done studies of if you do grocery shopping online, the things you order several days ahead tend to have more should items in them relative to want items than the things you purchase for delivery two hours from now. And the same applies, uh, applied in studies of, of consuming um, in the old days of, uh, of ordering DVDs for, for videos where not everything was on demand. What people would order farther in advance was a little more highbrow than that what they would order uh, just at the moment. And so taking that concept of now that we live digitally and we generate these small data, can we build online experiences and digital experiences that help tie these small data to these uh, behavioral economics concepts. So uh, a system we're building and exploring is something we call uh, Pushcart. And Pushcart is uh, for people doing online grocery shopping. You just automatically forward your receipt to a parsing engine that parses your, your grocery cart. And it, there's an oracle, at this point still human nutritionist, who looks at your grocery cart shopping and gives you nudges in the direction of more fresh produce and fresh fruit. Basically, more of this 
and less of that and pushes you towards planning perhaps to do some weekend shopping to prepare some meals so you can have some more, uh, you can have some home cooked meals and not everything is prepared foods. This is really uh, a very old concept. Uh, Odysseus tied himself to the mast of his boat to re resist the siren calls. And really what this is about is can we start to use the fact that we do things digitally and online to provide ourselves with some of this encouragement and scaffolding to do our planning and to do our, our pre-commitment because uh, now if you think about it, um, we need this running continu continuously since sort of the sirens of snack food are now omnipresent and you really can't live with yourself tied to a mast. You need more of this kind of support in your everyday life. So there's an example of small data coming back in feedback loops that the oracle that's giving you advice can see to what extent you're adapting to it and increasingly personalize it. Our language, I mentioned earlier, is another example of something that it contains a lot of content of how we're doing day to day, week to week, what our state of mind is, what our cognitive uh, performance level is. It's also a very good example of when, if you think about sharing it in the raw, there's way too much information in, uh, in, in just um, all of that language we utter by itself. We want to be able to process it in smart ways and pull out uh, interesting patterns. An example of, a, of uh, an application prototype that we're exploring uh, based on a combination of the language we utter as well as things like our physical activity and our location patterns, think about the kind of data you get from a moves application, uh, uh, for example, again, is something called Pulse where we are combining these different sources of activity into a, a simple overall pulse that could be shared selectively with a small number of friends or family. This is a uh, suggestion that actually came to me uh, in an email conversation with a woman about a year and a half ago, a woman named Gert, about 75 years old, who said, having read about some of my uh, uh, stuff online, that she really wished she had something to just loosely keep in touch with a small number of her friends, that they could sort of keep tabs on each other without feeling that somebody was looking over their shoulder. And it's a concept that has grown uh, to be of interest to uh, couples living apart from one another, other family members living apart from an one another, not to share your every moment's location, not to share the every, every, what time you're getting up every morning, not to literally share uh, the, uh, all, your, all of your uh, utterances, but to have some sense by which you could tell if suddenly somebody is really falling off their everyday patterns, isn't responding to email, isn't quite going on their neighborhood walks anymore. And so that brings me to connecting this around to what you guys are all here about, which is uh, the concept of can we do two things? First of all, could we begin to mine our games could we get personal data APIs to the games we play, the games you design, so that that can become part of the small data that I have available to me to feed things like a social pulse? And secondly, could we fuel some of those games with our small data streams? Could we begin to reflect in our games some of the things uh, we do in the physical world. This is a concept that's been around for quite a long time, but now the prevalence of these sorts of uh, small data that we generate and the beginning of this kind of a, a, a building of an ecosystem that would make those data readily available feels like it's now the time when we could begin to, in a more uh, systematic and broad way, make it possible that the games you play are driven by your physical activities in the real world, your uh, consumer behaviors, your sleep behaviors, your food consumption. And if we do that, combining and bringing those uh, data, small data in to fuel our games, then some of this might just be about engagement and personalization, but some of it might also support what this community is particularly about which is helping the use of games to support uh, behaviors that we aspire to. So really this is a call for uh, creating and joining a community, liberating these data through personal data APIs. So very interested, if others are as well, in a calling out to the 
uh, game community to be and take the lead in making personal data streams available to uh, back to the subscriber, uh, to create safe harbors for these data to be privately fused and filtered, and to then, and where the fun is, to create the great apps and experiences that will really engage people where their uh, with their data, to really bring together using small data to bridge between habit and uh, aspiration. And so I'm delighted to be here in New York at what we call the Small Data Lab at Cornell Tech, where a group of software developers, PhD students, technologists, and residents, and we look forward to collaborating with the Game for Change community. Thank you. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. Somebody's running across the stage. Did I end too early? Shocking. A professor who ended before her time. But I can't see any of you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so um, some entities are really quite interested, uh, particularly those entities who are regulated and are not free to do whatever they want with that data. But the one thing they probably can do is give it back to you. And so this does not prevent anyone, I'm not talking about ownership, and it doesn't prevent any, the companies from using the data for all the reasons they want to. That's a different story, okay? But uh, if you're uh, subject to common carriage, you're a cellular carrier, uh, if you're subject to the Cable Act, you're a cable TV provider, you are have limitations on what you can do with those data. But um, I've had a, a good success and started at the partnership, was on the previous slide, with uh, Time Warner and AT&T and Verizon, who are intrigued by this notion of what new kinds of apps and services and context might come from giving people back these data and building services around them. Nothing's gone commercial or nationwide or anything, but they've been very open to that. And in other contexts, we just do it because you, the individual does get their data back. It's clumsy, right? You order from Fresh Direct or Instacart or Peapod, you get an email receipt, set up automated forwarding, and we can parse it. Much better to have actual data APIs. Um, so I, I think there's a, while initially and maybe some of the bigger deep pockets of data, it's a little uh, bit of a PR concern, for the most part, the reception's been quite good. Yeah. So, um, HIPAA concerns come in when there's a doctor making clinical decisions based on data, or when it's um, actually clinical data. So for the most of everything I talked about, um, I didn't, this is a, I can't quite remember, I often talk about talks where it involves doctors and you would need to have HIPAA compliant data, but I'm not sure anything I talked about did. So for consumer facing apps where you're looking at the, uh, you know, food recommendations and things like that, we have lots of really interesting uh, innovations coming up just in the city, healthy out, healthy hand, there are lots of interesting recommendation systems going on. It's not actually relevant to HIPAA. That being said, I do work in the mobile health space and then we just treat the data in HIPAA compliant cloud services and you just do the right thing. I, I, I completely out of my control. I mean, that's something we can do politically, right? Ah, uh, sorry, yes. So what, are, what am I doing about um, third party data brokers who might uh, take these data and try to do target advertising? And the answer is, I'm not doing anything about that problem. That is an important problem of an important political issue, or, um, but it is not something that this is addresses at all because all the data I'm talking about already exist. Um, those data are still going to be used in all the ways they're currently being used or abused, whatever your uh, opinion is about that. And all I'm saying is, at least, could we as individuals get our data back to do something useful with them for ourselves? And yes, I believe there's a kind of maybe a little bit of an added power balance that could come through transparency. So it's not, a, it's not entirely lacking in some political motivation. 
but it doesn't address, it doesn't solve the question of how are our data used and combined and sold in all kinds of ways that we should be very concerned about. Yes. Yeah, start out by don't doing it, <laughs> by not doing it, right? Ah, uh, now I can see. I'm assuming somebody back there is going to tell me when to stop. Yeah. Has anybody already implemented the same thing, or is this the, the, the kind of standard example of leadership for others to follow, or is, it, is there any uh, uh, approach that would be different by, by looking at something like the NCA, for example, and saying, well, there's great data. What should we do with it? Okay. Yes, I don't have patience for the patience for those kinds of things either. So uh, separate things. First of all, this is what's interesting about this in not being a big data problem. In big data problem, which it's all huge and important, and I don't think big data is overhyped. I actually think it's really a big thing. Uh, but you need data from lots of individuals. With the approach we take here is that for any individual that starts to get their data streams, these apps work for them. We're not doing diagnostics across a population, okay? We're doing in-person variance and feedback for you based on your data. So it doesn't have to start with massive penetration. It can grow to bigger penetration. So that's, that's one problem where you can have a huge idea and it's very hard to get it started. So this is something that we can get started small communities at a time and start to prototype and demonstrate, and that's what we are doing, okay? Uh, shiny examples. Uh, the mobile health community, which is the mobile health community, M Health community, uh, is a good example, and I think the run keepers and the Fitbits um, and moves are good examples of people who are coming out with commercial products that provide APIs to allow a, a subscriber to programmatically get their data back to do something else with. That's about as good of an example as we lead, and that's the, and that's the lead we're, uh, we're following. Um, and yes, it's great, of course, when places like the MTA and others in this sort of open gov notion are making data sets available and saying people come here and do apps. I want them as the next step is to say, we will make an API available for our individual uh, riders to be able to get their data stream back, come back and make an app that works for individual riders, not just across an aggregate data set. Is there a community of practice around what you're doing and how do you access it to keep up with it? So we're, it's just starting. I think the best community of practice comes from the mobile health community. I should say I have a, another hat in which I'm a, a co-founder of a nonprofit called Open M Health, which is not about open data, but it's about open architecture and open standards for how you process and put these different types of data together. And so it's young, but it's there. It's been around for a couple of years, and uh, contact me, and that's what's, uh, that's what's growing. And maybe we're done. Thank you very much.